Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range U.S. focus forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Well, what I want to do as we start to transition out of our summer and toward fall, now that we've begun, uh, begun September here, is I want to work our way from the western United States toward the south and back to the Midwest. My goal here is to provide some perspective on any long-range weather forecasting. Now, if you've been watching my Western weather uh, updates here, my Western U.S. weather updates, we've been focusing a lot on how this summer has been quite different from recent summers, especially with respect to fires. And this was a satellite image yesterday taken by MODIS, and it shows largely a smoke-free Western U.S. You know, compared to recent past, this was the same day back in 2017, where after having an extremely hot June and July uh, and August, we were still burning almost every Everywhere across the Western United States. So to go back and just to see, uh, you know, how green things are, first of all, and secondly, how, um, well, how clear the atmosphere is, is a remarkable thing. Now, what I want to show you is our latest drop monitor update. And I've been putting this in the regional updates, but let's just put it in this long range one as well. We know that in the West United States, uh, our drought that's been in the kind of the northwest corner of the U.S. here has largely remained unchanged throughout the last several months, and California's largely been drought-free. Uh, in fact, in yesterday's Western Regional Update, we talked about how California's reservoir health is some of the best I've seen. The southwestern monsoon has been lacking. And we started to see drought creep into this area. But I want to show you what I mean by a lack of extreme. I got four regions. So this is Yakima, which is in Washington. I've got Eugene in Oregon. We're going to go to Red Bluff, which is in the Sacramento Valley here in Northern California. We'll go to Fresno, which is kind of more central Southern California. And when you look at these graphs, what I want you to notice is on each graph, where the top line is and the bottom line is, that represents the, the hottest and the coldest for any given day. And while we have had brief time periods of intense heat in the western United States from north to south, nothing has been sustained. We've just not seen sustained well above average temperatures that are bordering on extremes. And what's amazing is, and if you can see it over here in the right, hopefully you're watching all of this in full screen, uh, notice that spring of 2019, looking at NOAA's um, extreme weather indicator, okay, it was very, very low. We're waiting to get the summer data, but I am imagining by looking over here at temperatures that we're going to see that the values are much lower than the climatological mean or even the 10-year the, the running mean here. So it's important to know that the western United States has seen, to be honest, compared to recent past, a pretty phenomenal year. Let's transition now to the south. We know that since the beginning of, of this spring all the way through summer, we've really favored a lot more ridging over the south, especially the southeast and the not. And that's why we are way ahead of average on the accumulation of heat here since the beginning of March, which is what we're seeing in this map. These are growing degree day anomalies. Even in Texas, where you see the, the cooler here, much of this was early in the season when the jet stream was dipping down like this, where we saw a lot of active severe weather uh, and a lot of cooler days. But certainly over the last month, look at this area in through here, we've been much above average in terms of temperatures. So when we think about where we're going in the south, we have seen that because of ridging that has kind of wobbled from here over to the West United States and back and forth between the two, that not only is this kind of shut down the monsoonal flow at times, but it's brought a uh, drought. I'll take these drawings up here. It's brought a lot of drought back into parts of Texas and Oklahoma. Meanwhile, when you come into the lower Mississippi River Valley, several big rainfall events, you'll see them in a few minutes here, have kept this region largely drought free. And it's just isolated pockets of drought in the southeast here. A lot of this probably going to be erased by uh, where Hurricane Dorian is going right now. So just looking back over the last 60 days, you can really see the disparity here. In the lower Mississippi River Valley, a lot of thunderstorm activity, very, very heavy rainfall, plus a tropical storm Barry earlier in this time period. Where there are places in Texas, while that's been so wet in the lower Mississippi River Valley, places in Texas, some locations over the last 60 days have seen no rainfall. It's incredible to see that. And again, over in the southeast, some pockets of drier conditions, but Florida very wet. Uh, it's certainly getting added to here by the spiral wind bends of Dorian. And so we need to just understand what we've got in terms of precipitation here across the southern region as we transition out of summer and head toward fall. Now, Dorian, in the last uh, three days here, you can see really just hitting the, the, the far eastern side of Florida pretty hard here with some heavier rainfall, two, three, four inch rainfall amounts, some locally heavier amounts. But as we're going to see in a few moments, this system is going to trek right here along the coast 
uh, and as it does so, it could be bringing some very heavy rains to Georgia, uh, North and South Carolina. So the latest we have on Dorian, we're going to do this quickly because we'll get you a better update tomorrow, is that several of the European ensemble members have this going right along the coast, about uh, six of them actually coming right on shore here. The majority are trying to keep the, the main path off of the coast, but we're expecting this to kind of look like a, a buzzsaw just cutting right there along the southeastern coast of the United States. So the potential exists, if you look over here on the map on the right, for better than six inches of rainfall to fall in a, nor uh, a really narrow corridor that runs right in through here to the east of that location. Meanwhile, if you get just to the west of there, much of our southern region has a very dry next week or so compared to normal. Uh, much of the action is going to be way up here in the northern plains and the Canadian prairies. And that's what I take you to next. This is our next 15 days. You can clearly see the preferred storm track will be in the northern part of the United States moving through the Great Lakes states with drier conditions down here stretching from central Texas back over to the southeast. But at this time of year, the wild card is always the tropics for the southern region. And right now, what do we have? Well, we have Tropical Storm Ferdinand here. Dorian, of course, I'll show you, which I just showed you, sorry, moving right up along the coast. We have uh, Gabrielle, our next name system sitting here. And coming off of the west coast of Africa, more systems in place. Remember, September 10th through the 15th is the peak in hurricane season. So now that we're into September, we're just getting things cranked up. Now, to spare you some details here, I'll let you know the upper levels of the atmosphere are very conducive over the coming days and even weeks to letting more systems form in the tropics, which means we're going to have to keep a close eye on it every day. So what this does is this leaves me with a, a discussion about the Midwest, uh, the Great Plains in the Northeast. So we know that our, our problems stem from earlier this year an enormous amount of rainfall. So this is year-to-date departure from normal rainfall. And we're off my chart here. We're off the end of my color bar in most locations. Even over the last two weeks, now we're looking at percent of normal, we can see there have been some drier pockets from parts of South Dakota through Iowa, southern Minnesota, Wisconsin, even over into Indiana and parts of Michigan, but surrounding it some locally very, very heavy rainfall. Some locations getting hit many times, like, like this little corridor right in through here. Let me draw it in white right in through here uh, in parts of eastern Kansas and western Missouri. Now that doesn't mean that other places haven't been wet, but I've just seen that location get hit time and time again. So when we come back to our drought monitor one last time, remember that there are places right in through here that had been missed, you know, over the last uh, couple of months. And that's where the longer term drought monitor is showing up with some drought. For example, if I take you to Moline, Illinois, which is right in through here, Look, from the end of June through most of July and beginning of August, no rainfall really to be measured. And so even though they're well above their climatological normal here, uh, as much as 10 inches above normal, uh, remember, they did have this prolonged time period in this corridor stretching through here where it just didn't rain very much. But recently, some heavier rains have moved through that area, which has got all of our attention now turned to the colder weather that is in place, that has been in place over the last 30 days in the Canadian prairies, and at times has come down into the north central plains. We've been talking about how that's a reservoir of colder air. Should the jet stream get into a configuration to tap into it, it could pull it south. Okay, it could pull this to the south. All right. Now, people have been asking me some crazy stuff about this full moon that's coming up on Friday the 13th. And so I just want to address something here. Our weather does not follow lunar cycles. And just because it's an interesting day like like the 13th uh, doesn't Friday the 13th doesn't mean that there's some sort of special correlation there by the way I do own a three wolves one moon shirt and since I bought it it has changed my life uh, so I recommend all of you go get one of these shirts they're pretty fun but let's talk about what's actually coming at that time period yesterday we saw a major change in our global models I'm going to show you the GFS ensemble but the European looked very similar to it for a moment and that was we picked up on this massive cool down coming through on the 13th of September. And many of us said, hey, we got to step back and look at this much more closely. Why I'm such a massive shift in the models? Well, a lot of this had to do with what was going on in the tropics way over in the Western Pacific. Uh, basically, a typhoon was moving to the north, getting absorbed into the flow, really causing a highly amplified pattern, just tanking temperatures here. And all of a sudden, there was a renewed worry of a very, very early frost. Now, when I say very early frost, take a look at this. We're focusing again on the Midwest and the Northern Plains here. What is the normal frost? Well, for each of the cities, Fargo, Sioux Falls, Kearney, Minneapolis, you can see them here. I put in blue what the median first frost date is. So for Fargo, it's September 27th. Sioux Falls, September 30th. Kearney, 
uh, October 11th. As you go east, the dates tend to be more in October and the farther south later in October. What I then did was I found a recent early frost. And for Minneapolis, Des Moines, Madison, Peoria, Indy, and uh, Lansing, uh, what you see here in the first frost, so these dates over on this side, that's actually the last time that those cities saw a September frost, okay? But over here in parts of, of Fargo, you can see we had a 2011 September 15th frost, a 2011 September frost, uh, September 15th frost in Sioux Falls, and uh, Kearney down here had a, a September 29th back in 2005. But if you look, 1995 seems to be a date that sticks out in this section of the country. We've been you know, talking a lot about the growing degree day unit deficit in parts of the Northern Plains. So if, and this is a big if, if we're going to have a frost, well, this is what happened in 1995, and it's something I've been preaching for a while, a highly amplified trough ridge pattern. See that? Big ridge pushes up into western Canada. That shoves the cold air that is in place there toward the south on a big leading edge front. And here was the leading edge of that front, that cold front. So this is surface temperature anomalies on, these date, on this date back on, uh, in 1995. So the warmth comes here, the cold moves out, and that sent us into this early frost. So without a highly amplified pattern, we don't get early frost. That's my main point here, okay? What did the sea level pressure do? Well, it had to get into a high pressure configuration here around the Great Lakes states, which calmed the winds down. See how calm the winds were right inside here? And that allows, if we have a full moon on the night, for you to see it, first of all, uh, and for the uh, temperatures to bottom out. So remember, a lot of times that, that idea that a full moon in fall means a frost, the, the, the thinking here is that if you see the full moon, so that means you have high pressure, clear skies, light wind, so you could see it. All right, that's why that, that analogy is there. But September the 13th is not going to be the case for that, all right? We're not seeing those things coming together. What are we seeing? We'll take a look at this animation. These are low temperatures through the next few days. So Thursday low temperatures, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What do we notice? We have three or two fronts. Here comes the first one, Wednesday into Thursday, sweeping through the Great Lakes states. Here comes the next one. This is toward the end of the week, Saturday into Sunday. And we were seeing temperatures like in northern you know, uh, Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan, getting down here, flirting with those low 30s. Remember, we talked about that just the other day. And we can see that, yeah, those cooler temperatures are in place. Maybe by Monday, we could have here like north of Manitowish waters, Land O'Lakes, this area in parts of the UP that may get down to a low to mid 30. Uh, but that's not where we're growing corn and soybeans. That's not where we're, you know, we're growing pine trees up here, okay? So it's important to kind of see that difference. When we stretch this out a little bit longer, yes, the next five days carries a cool bias in this area. We do have those two fronts coming through, but look what happens as we get out to day six through 10 in the forecast. At that point, the jet stream tends to do a bit more like this. I'll show you in a few minutes and some heat returns to a lot of the Corn Belt. Uh, looking out towards days 11 through 15, now that the models have kind of calmed down after throwing that big typhoon into the mix, we no longer see the major cool bias in this area. In fact, it's, it's moderating quite a bit in the mid-September forecast here. Now, why is that? Well, it's all about the flow of the jet stream, and it's about what we don't see more than what we, I guess, we do see. So I just played this out for you all the way to September the 20th, and if I just step it back, <clears throat> you know what I don't see happening anytime soon is this highly amplified pattern where we dig in a deep trough here and a massive ridge there that brings in a deep trough like that. That's what you got to get for us to get a big frost. Instead, the flow pattern's a bit more zonal, more west to east. And there are troughs coming in, like take a look at this, the 9th, 10th, and 11th. Yeah, this trough coming in the west coast, that's actually gonna build heat across the Corn Belt, cooling the west coast down. And even with time here, I just see a strong jet stream coming across the Pacific. Strong jet streams don't, well, they resist blocking, so they don't get blocked up. And if they don't get blocked up, we don't get huge ridges that go into Canada that shove a lot of cold air south. So this is the wrong amplitude to bring in a really high confidence forecast in an early frost. And even as I take you all the way out here into September, having a ridge that sits over the Aleutian Islands and a trough in the Gulf of Alaska builds a broader ridge across much of the United States and keeps the cold air tucked away up here, uh, you know, closer to, to Hudson Bay. 
So that's the bigger picture with all of this. Now, some folks are gonna be looking at a model called the CFSV2. Run to run, the CFSV2 has been very highly variable over the last three to four runs. Right now, week four, this is now the kind of getting toward the end of September. It is trying to bring in another big wave of colder air right here into the central United States. Why? Well, it's trying to bring in that highly amplified pattern. See it? Troughs and ridges, troughs here, ridges right in through there. That's what we would need. But remember, this is the end of September, beginning of October. And I have no faith or trust in the CFSV2 right now, given its high model to model run variability. You might ask, well, what's the European model doing? Uh, the European model, it has got a warm bias in its ensemble all the way through the end of September. So it's, it's showing warm all the way through the end of September. What I'm here to tell you today is, we cannot right now live outside of a 15-day forecast, even a 10-day forecast, as we transition out of summer into fall. Several reasons for this, very weak teleconnections. The Man-Julian oscillation hanging out in the null phase, it's not giving us much of a clue. We've seen the collapse of El Nino since back in July. Cooler waters have emerged. We've now gone over when if you look at ocean temperatures alone, it looks to be uh, uh, La Nina trying to develop here. But the atmosphere is actually behaving more what we call enso neutral. The Southern Oscillation Index came right up to zero and has now kind of come right back down here just below zero. It's not way down here where it would need to be if we had full-blown El Nino conditions or way up here if we had full-blown La Nina. It's hanging around near zero. What am I seeing in terms of ocean uh, wind patterns? Well, right now we have easterly winds here and westerly winds on this side, and they're kind of um, competing with one another. This is more just about tropical convection in the open uh, Pacific, not El Nino, La Nina type behavior. And even in the upper levels of the atmosphere, I see a bit of a pattern going back to the beginning of August to mid-August, where we're exhausting upper level uh, motion here and then suppressing it and exhausting it and, and suppressing it again. So the upper levels of the atmosphere are kind of transitioning through this mode, resisting getting blocked up and staying in one mode for too long. And that's important because what that means for us is, while right now the jet stream is largely unblocked coming across the Pacific, even though we do get this little weak high over low pattern, this whole wave packet is moving with time. The jet stream is trying to stay north and it's trying to ridge to the south of it. And if it continues to do that, well, that, that particular pattern means, well, I can't really forecast it well beyond 15 days, first of all. And second of all, if it stays in Canada, wow, that just isn't the highly amplified. Remember, it's not this bringing in that cold air. It's just not there. So this is, I'm trying to take off the worry of this super early September frost in this video. And that's what we're doing here. There is a wild card. The wild card's right there. We have multiple typhoons that are kind of showing up in the Western Pacific. And as I've stated, they can get pulled up into the mid-latitude flow and get the jet stream quite a bit more wavy with time. And that is our major source of uncertainty as we move forward, the tropics, both the Atlantic and the Pacific. So I'm trying to build a case here to letting you know that when we hear some of the hype about some of these massive changes model to model run and with the potential for these super early frosts that we need to take step back and take a steady hand with all of it. And that's my main story in today's long range forecast update and I hope that I conveyed it clearly to you. With that though, I'll go and wrap it up right there. We at Nutrient Ag Solutions, thank you for your attention. Hope you look forward to all of our forecast videos that come out at my.nutrientagsolutions.com. Have a great end to your week and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.